the Gospels in some ways are written to help Christians. They're all mostly internal documents. As they're written for communities, for Christians to come to terms with their ambivalence about following Jesus in terms of their particular context and issues. And so if you have no ambivalences about following Jesus, then you're probably not following Jesus. <laughs> because there's, it's going to challenge you, right? So um, the exegetical approach, um, you know, this idea that a text would, so if you don't go away with anything from this course, this is the one thing I want you to live by for the rest of your life, which is a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. So this is the way you approach all documents, all documents. But the Bible in particular is the one that's most suspect to this kind of abuse. Um, so we talked about the three worlds of the text, and again, I think what's fascinating about the approach that we're adopting here is that it tries to integrate all three. So that we, you know, many scripture scholars will study the world either of the text or behind the text, and that's what they do best, and that's what they need to do. But in some ways, we need to bring it forward to our world, and so the interplay of these three worlds of the text is so extremely important um, for making sense of, of what they say. I mean, in some sense, our context can then speak to their context. It's not just a one-way street, but then we begin to, you know, make sense of their context in light of our context. So it's, you know, it's a two-way street with the text as the sort of the road. Um, I'm just amazed. I mean, I just can't tell you in, in doing this, in the study that I've been doing in this for a year, few years and teaching it, how just utterly sophisticated these documents are and how they just evade, you know, have evaded me for all my life. Uh, and it's helped me move from the process of being sort of perpetually confused and perplexed. Like, why does the gospel say that? What's that about? Um, to feeling like a dummy like a real dummy, um, to thinking that the text, and the text is irrelevant to me because I don't understand it uh, in our world, to a completely you know, novel appreciation, a radical appreciation for the kinds of enlightenment um, on what they're about, and then being able to, again, make sense of them in our life, whether it's this church or this society or this time period. Um, again, the approach that we're adopting is this sort of circle in which we're sort of interplay between um, the gospel text and the community, starting with the community, working back to the gospel, and then rereading the, the, the gospel text in light of that community. Um, and this approach, I think, inoculates us from opposing our lives kind of directly onto the text, kind of what we call eisegetically, and it frees the text to talk to us. Uh, again, here's the third part that then our context comes into play. So you see the three worlds and how they interplay there. So this is all familiar with you. One of the things about you, Matthew, that's, that we begin to ask questions, well, what, how, how does the text differ and why does it differ, is that we have this great gift called the Gospel of Mark. So the Gospel, the two-source or four-source hypothesis begins us to begin to see how Matthew is different because Mark is the template. And so then Matthew is the, the cover song, so to speak, the redoing, the... Of it, and but a radical, not just a simple cover, but a um, a, a complete radical change in which it's the same story, but it's so different. So we can begin to look at um, you know what's fascinating is that 90% of Mark is replicated in the Matthean text, 90%. Yet it's completely radically reorganized and uh, redacted. And redacted is a fancy word for edited. It's the, what the biblical scholars use for editing. Uh, and then the other source, you know, the, the, the three sources of Matthew are Mark and then um, Q. And you can see here again that uh, Q is this document that's shared in Matthew and Luke but not in Mark. And so then you can begin to look at how Matthew and Luke use the same material yet differ in how they present it. So you have another contrast that helps you understand the differences. And then finally, you have the material that is unique to Matthew, which we call M. Um, so Mark, based, one of the you know, chief clues in all of this is how Mark completely takes the, uh, excuse me, how Matthew takes the, the Mark and material and completely reorganizes it into kind of a three and a tripartite structure. Um, so it's three parts. Uh, it, it's kind of you know there's a first and a second, uh, and then in the middle is the is the is the presentation of Jesus' teaching. 
Jesus in Matthew is a talker. Well, actually in John, he's a talker. In, 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 uh, in, in Matthew, he's a teacher. He's a rabbi. He is the rabbi of rabbis. And he's more than a rabbi, but he's basically about the mode of teaching. And he's going he's gonna to present what's called Christian Torah. Um, so you have the origins of Jesus, um, all of those introductory material. Then you have the main sort of heart of of Matthew, which in some sense is almost more important than the third part, which is the passion of Jesus, which for him is really the Passover. It's the reenacting of the, of the Exodus narrative. And um, also, the, uh, also it's a Passover in the sense that it's also, also a Yom Kippur. So when I didn't put that in there, but Jesus in some ways in Matthew celebrates both a, a Passover and a Yom Kippur on the same night, which is a little strange. But... Um, there's a meaning. There's, me, there's, there's a meaning to the madness, and then the, the the gospel ends with the great commission, which in some sense is the sort of culmination. I mean, I guess it's the falling action, it's the denouement, but it it sort of is the key text or the key sort of point of the entire gospel. Uh, what are we what we're talking about here is you see that the way I've arranged the first uh, the five discourses, uh, of course, uh, what's so magic. In, in Jewish thought about five. Yeah, there's the Pentateuch, right? There's five books. So Jesus is going to give us the five books of Christian Torah. And as you can see the way I've arranged them, that it's just kind of great that it's five because in a, I think, in a chiastic structure. Yeah, here we go. So as you can see, they're arranged one, one and five, two and four, and then at the heart of the matter is the parabolic discourse in which the kingdom is truly understood and revealed, but is then kind of ripples out to these other uh, two pairs. So what's a chiasm? Well, that's the letter X. And, you know, those of you who like pirates and, you know, that's where they bury their treasure, their map, they put the X on the map. X marks the spot, right? So you dig where the, the two lines intersect. Um, and so X, a chiasm, is, comes from the word chi, which is Greek for X. So we have any Chi Omegas out here? Chi Omegas? My mom's a Chi Omega, so I just happen to know that as a kid. But, so she's in the sorority, right? So the Greek, it's a Greek word, Chi, and it's X. And uh, basically, you, it's really a V, and to be honest with you, because you take out the bottom part. But the, it's, 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 it's A corresponds to A1 to A2, B1. And then, so the heart of the matter is where C is located. And that's a classic chiastic structure, which you actually can see in modern poetry, but it's more common in the ancient world. So going back, again, at the heart of the Christian Torah is Matthew's reconfiguring of the, parab the parables, in which he adds some, takes them out. Um, we heard one on Sunday, right? Does everybody remember that one? The, yeah, the, the tenants, the bad tenants. And you're like, what's that about? That's such a strange story. And not only that, not, see, the problem also with math, not the problem, but some scholars have observed that, I'm going to hide behind them, um, that um, Matthew just doesn't put out the parables and leave them open-ended. Mark does. And I think the reason Mark does, he wants his uh, listeners, his audience, his community members to struggle with what does it really mean to take up the cross of Jesus. So he leaves it very open-ended with no resolution, whereas Matthew, as a teacher, is not going to left anything not completely understood, least he be misinterpreted, and teachers hate when students don't, you know, repeat back what they've said. So um, he tends to allegorize the parables, and an allegory is kind of a one-to-one, -one in which he'll then explain how it applies, and typically he Matthew's allegorizing about his current situation and context of his church and his community and their issues. So then he'll explain it. In some sense, he takes out the struggle by making it evident and clear. Again, that's what teachers do. They're supposed to be clear, concise, get rid of vagueness, and that's what Matthew does. So it, it, there are parables. They're meant to both create a world and subvert people's expectations, but he also allegorizes them in which you can see, then he says, well, this is what the Pharisees are about, or this is what, and he'll explain it. 
Uh, and we don't, scholars don't think that Jesus actually spoke that way. They think he spoke more in the Markan style of the parables. Um, so there's a chiastic structure. One of the ways we know about how we get clues about what makes the portrait of Jesus in, in Matthew different from Mark is this, the editing that takes place. So we think that you know, a good scribe, as you can see, that structure, that three-part type structure with everything is very well organized. And so it begins to, begins to hint that um, the, myth, the scribe at Matthew is, is, is he's, he's a Jewish scribe. Uh, and you know, he's coming out of the, that tradition, even though the scribes get a very bad name. And the, um, and the Gospel of Matthew, along with the Pharisees, um, you know, because they're not Christian scribes. <laughs> they're non-Christian scribes. So uh, we can see in terms of the organization, um, there are certain examples of that. There's abbreviation. Mark, will, uh, Matthew will edit out uh, details in Matthew because they're just kind of messy. So a lot of things are left out. A lot of things are reorganized. Um, there's uh, a sophistication in, in Mark, excuse me, in Matthew that's lacking in, 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 in Mark, in which Mark almost uses uh, the word immediately, the way that most of us use the word um, or ah, uh, and and. So it's like, it's like, but Mark has a purpose, because Mark is, the, immediately is always about the urgency for Mark of the gospel. The urgency, you know, you have to get back into the game. Um, the, you know, the persecution is, is continuing, so... But again, he sort of edits that out. And then um, uh, Matthew's more accurate, and you know, King Herod becomes the Tetrarch, which is, you know, there, wasn't, there was three of them, right? There's three Herods uh, hanging out in that part of the world. Um, this is all, again, from, from Powell. Um, we also get the idea that the context is prosperous, urban, and communal. And so Matthew admit, omits much of the... Um, Matthean material uh, it admits Mark's explanation of Jewish customs. Why? Because he presumes his audience, which scholars have posited is almost entirely Jewish, um, they don't need to know that. They already know it. And the, also the idea that, um, you know, this idea of, of, of changing the KOG to the kingdom of heaven, which evidences sort of the way Jews like to not invoke, you know, kind of a circumlocution about avoiding using the name of God. And then heaven also symbolizes the sanctity of the divine. It's the realm of the divine. It's divine, it's, it's, it's holiness. It's not a place. So again, when people think, Christians think about the kingdom of heaven, or they talk about it, they're thinking of it as an alternate reality, when in fact it's just contrasted with earth. So heaven and earth, are they're symbolic. Um, so out of respect that there's, you know, God, the sanctity of God's name, not invoking God's name, um, we also get the idea that he changes, he talks a lot about the polis as opposed to the uh, uh, kome, uh, and because he's, it's more urban. And then um, he, changes, he changes like monetary uh, denominations so that people don't think that, you know, a copper is, yeah, sure, I give a copper. Yeah, I got that. So he changes some of that. Um, oops, Sorry. I got to do this at the same time, don't I? There you go. Take a look. You're like, you should just wave your hand like this. It's like, there's nothing up there anymore. <laughs> okay. So another way that um, we begin to see the differences in, in how Matthew tailors is the different uh, portraits of, of Jesus, the disciples, and the religious leaders of Israel. Uh, so Jesus is presented in a more kind of large and in charge manner, just like most teachers like to present themselves, right? Like, we're authoritative. You listen to us. You need to listen to us. We have no real foibles. That's not true. But, um, but the idea is, is that in, 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 um, in Matthew, uh, any reference to Jesus not knowing something, and there's ten of them, is just taken out. He just takes them out. And... Um, any statements that might, you know, demonstrate a, a lack of ability or, or an authority question, right? So uh, teachers don't like to have their authority questioned. Uh, so um, that's all taken out too. Uh, Jesus' emotions, the kind of the, 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 the emotional presentation of Jesus you get in Mark in order to, oh, thank you, thank you. I owe you like $5. 
Um, sorry, I just need to... I'm looking at this because I was told not to look at that because then the, the camera has me... Anyway, I'll look over here. So, uh, uh, so the emotions are taken out. Um, and again, Jesus is sort of a, you know, uh, I, I mean, anybody see the Paper Chase, the original series? I mean, not the series, but the original movie, you know, John Houseman, right. right? Professor Kingsfield, right? Did he show any emotion? No. I mean, he's a teacher. He was, he was the teacher. He's the master. So that's kind of taken out. Um, and then anything that would portray Jesus as a magician just appears. I mean, Mark doesn't do this, but it's open to false interpretation. So Matthew locks it down because he doesn't want people to get the wrong idea about Jesus. He's not really, his miracles and his wonders have nothing to do with, they're supposed to enhance and back up his teaching. They're like examples of his teaching, but they're not to be considered in and themselves. Again, that's Pal. Um, the portrait of the disciples is, is they, Matthew completely rehabilitates the disciples. They go from being complete dutterheads and, uh, you know, no faith, people of no faith, to uh, people of little faith. And you're thinking, well, that's an insult, right? Ye of little faith? No, it's actually compared to the, you know, the Markin guys, it's an improvement. A radical improvement. And, and you can see this all over the place. Um, you know, they, have, they go from zero understanding to really being slow. Um, and they, they, they shift from being really, you know, kind of wretched, dreadful, obstinate, invincibly ignorant people uh, to worshiping Jesus and calling him Lord. That's a real change. And you can actually see this. Uh, where you see this the most is the comparison between the two. Uh, there's two calming of the sea episodes in, 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 in Matthew and, and in Mark. And in the second one where, um, the first one where he calms it, they, um, yeah, they, the disciples didn't understand their hearts were hardened. Whereas here they have the complete opposite effect and they call him Lord and Son of God, which for, for Matthew is a much more loaded term than it is for Mark. For Mark, it's just the beloved. So in Mark, the Son of God refers to Jesus as, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Whereas for uh, Matthew, he's literally God's son. Like, yeah. So <laughs> he's from God. And so that's where the infancy narratives come into play. Um, whereas Mark, there's no, there's no birth stories. Um, and it just begins with the baptism. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the, this is funny, right? So... Um, in, in Mark, you know, the James and John are like, they're vying for, you know, to be the Secretary of State and the, the you know, whoever, Chief of Staff or whatever. And um, Jesus calls them down on that. But instead, in, you know, uh, Matthew's uh, mother, uh, James and John's mother and Matthew's a good Jewish mother. She's, you know, saying, what about my sons? What, uh, what can you do for them? So, obviously, none of your Jewish mothers. So, okay, so, uh, whoops. Okay, and the portrayal of the Jewish leaders is exceptionally negative. It is incredibly negative. It is, they cannot be more worse. Um, the most vitriolic words come out of Jesus and John the Baptist's mouth about the religious leaders, uh, almost at the expense of kind of whitewashing or softening the way the Romans are depicted. And we'll see that in a minute. I mean, literally, Pilate washes his hands. So the gospel washes the Romans. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a, in Mark, there's a good scribe. And he, at first he praises Jesus, and then he, and then he begins to test him in the other one. Um, all the, and any friendly guys like uh, Jarius and Joseph, or, they're still there. Like, Matthew doesn't take them out, but he just omits the fact of, like Joseph Arimathea is in the Sanhedrin, <laughs> and that Jarius is a, is a Jewish synagogue official. So the, community, the gospel of, of Matthew, the community of Emmanuel and the new Moses. So here's a, here's a question. So again, the ability to read the gospels mostly pertains to your ability to play make-believe. So if you can't get into Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, you can't get into the Gospels. You have to visualize and understand yourself as in those scenes, in which if you actually do any work in Ignatian spirituality, 
that's what they want you to do. Right? They want you to go there. They want you to put yourself in the scene. So um, you pretend, I want you to pretend um, that you're in a adolescent community. And adolescence is, is an indication of growing pains. Right? It's going through puberty. So it's a big transition from being brand new to being an adult. So it's there in the middle stages. Um, it's diaspora Jews. Now, I've got to say something about diaspora. What is diaspora? And diaspora are people who are living in a land that is not their native land. And America, except for, I mean, America is a completely diaspora country, a world, a continent, except that, you know, the first people that came over, you know, didn't take a boat. They walked over the land bridge. And so, uh, you know, the original peoples are really not diaspora people, but they kind of are. But most of the other people who come after the first peoples, the first nations, are diaspora people. And so you think about the nature of people who come from a different country. When they come to a new country, there is the pressure to do what? Assimilate, right? And if you know anything about that, the first generation that comes over usually really, really they double down on their ethnic identity. So, uh, and they, and of course, by the time that their grandchildren come around, they're, they don't speak the language, they don't know the cultural, cultural customs. So, for example, like, and I, I hate to use the Irish again as an example because I got in trouble a couple weeks ago for that, but, um, uh, you know, and it's going to make fun of Americans, okay, so it's okay. Um, you know, <laughs> right? What's, what is the Irish holiday in America? St. Patrick's Day, right? And so that St. Patrick's Day, everybody in Chicago and Boston and New York, they have these massive parades, everybody's Irish, they drink green beer, they throw up in the streets, they fight, whatever. Okay, so does that happen in, if you're in Dublin on, on that day, what, what's going on? Nothing. Nothing. So, see, in America, if you're Irish, you have to show you're Irish because you have to resist the assimilation process. So the Italian, everybody has these ethnic, you know, parades and, carnivals and festivities, and so that's part of it. So you, you usually, so diaspora people really have to hold on to their identity because the process of assimilation is so intense. So Jews living outside of Palestine are more Jewish than the Jews living in Palestine. So they really, their identity is at stake. Um, so you're, you're, a, you're a, a, a diaspora Jew who is a part of, a, of a, an assembly, a liturgical assembly, which would be a synagogue for, for folks, uh, and L Matthew is the only person that uses the word ecclesia, which is what we call church. Um, but he doesn't, and it actually says church in the English, but Jews don't know what that is, right? They don't know what a, a kirke is, a church. They're, they're, that's a synagogue. So their synagogue, their community synagogue, is, is dedicated to, uh, you know, Yeshua. Um, and that's, just the, that's the, you know, the translation of his name who is Israel's, who's from Galilee, and he's Israel's uh, Messiah, our Christos. And so he's you know, thoroughly Jewish. Um, so what happens? Well, there's, a, there's, not, there's more than one synagogue in town in Antioch. There's also the Pharisee-led synagogue across the street. Now, Pharisees at the time of Jesus were not that powerful and numerous, but after the destruction of the temple, the whole priesthood and the temple system collapses, and nature abhors a vacuum, and so what takes its place? Pharisaic Judaism, which becomes rabbinic Judaism, is the form of Judaism we have today. So rabbis aren't priests, right? Rabbis aren't ordained. Rabbis are teachers. They're laymen. They're well-educated laymen, and they're educated in the Torah. So they really place their emphasis on Torah as opposed to ritual. So they're teachers. Um, and they're practitioners and, you know, prescribers of the law. Um, so there's another synagogue across the street from this uh, Christian uh, Jewish synagogue uh, who, who look upon you and your community as deviant. And they discriminate against you in mild forms of what we now call microaggression, and as well as you know, more public and violent forms of humiliation. So, what's interesting is that this is what happens to people. And, you know, uh, people who begin to experience these things, what do they do? They want to then make themselves, they want to legitimate themselves, make themselves more respectable in the eyes of those who are persecuting them. And so they begin to outdo them in their virtue. 
And actually, you see this. Actually, I was reading about W. DuBose and uh, about how the, you know the politics of respectability within the African American community in the mid centuries. They're trying to show that they're they're more decent than more moral and decent of standing than white folks, right? because they've been told they're not. So that I polit that identity that identity politics and the politics of respectability is also what's taking place here. People speculate, and so what do they begin to do? They begin to ape and imitate. The Pharisee, the Pharisees, especially the leaders. So the leaders of the Methian community are beginning to try to, you know, forgive the phrase, out Jew the Jews. By showing that Christian Jews are a uh, Jewish Christians are more excuse me, Christian Jews, which is the proper way to say it, are more Jewish than non Christian Jews. So um, that's a kind of a pickle, huh? So here's the question. In the midst of your community's identity crisis, what kind of gospel that is portrait of Jesus would you create that both does two things? One, preserves your, uh, your Jewish heritage and identity while remaining faithful to um, the person that they don't consider to be very Jewish. Um, there's a twofold strategy to this. Um, well. So the twofold strategy is one, A, one, is to present Jesus as the most Jewish of Jews. So this is some of the themes that Powell picks up. Basically, these were Powell's themes, but they've been kind of reincorporated to this strategy. And then the second is to portray the, the non-Christian uh, Jews in the most negative light possible, because they're the antithesis of what you're trying. But see, you want to, you're telling your leaders, you have to avoid being like those people because it's actually antithetical to the, what our rabbi is telling us how to be a, rat, how to be a, a follower of Torah, to be a, a faithful member of the covenant. So um, you see this hostility, this incredible hostility to Jewish leaders. And what's ironic is that, of course, Matthew's the most Jewish of all gospels, yet it's been used by Christians to promote the most serious, disgusting forms of anti-Semitism the world's ever seen. I mean, that's where the word Christ killer comes from. Or, you know, it's, it's from the Mathean. So what a historical irony. But it makes sense because how can... So Jews that are, are critiquing Jews, that's kind of the hint here, right? So that they're critiquing them because they're trying to tell their leaders, stop acting like that. Stop appropriating those mores. Stop, act, you know, stop being like that. Because those ways are not the ways of Jesus. And so a lot of the conflicts you see between Jesus and the Pharisees are anachronistic. Jesus could not have had those conflicts in some ways. They don't appear in Mark either. The Mark, the Pharisees are not, they don't wear a black hat. They're not villains. Where here they're completely villainized. There's not a single good one of them amongst them. So it's, they're completely demonized. Why? Because that's the temptation. And the, you know, the disciples had to get so. In some ways, the Gospel of Matthew is the quintessential first early apostolic church manual. How to be church, how not to be church. It's, an ecclesi it's a practical ecclesiology. It's not like, it's not like uh, heavy concepts like you get in Lumen Gentium, people of God, right? No, it's like the day-to-day -day living of Christianity. How to be church, which includes how to be disciple, how to lead, you know, etc. So I'm not going to read this quote, but, it, but it's, it's so damning and, you know, the, this notion of the brood of vipers, the poisonous character of, of the Pharisees, how they're poisoning everybody's minds and their hearts. And it's not just the leaven of the Pharisees, it's the poison. It's poison. I mean, it will, it'll kill you. It's, it's lethal. And so you can read the, um, the, 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 in, the, the polemic here against the Pharisees. And he just, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and then, you know, after this long diatribe, then there's the seven woes to the Pharisees. Of course, seven, magic number for Jews, seven days. So it's like a totalizing dismissal of their entire understanding of how to live the covenant, how to be, uh, you know, um, Jewish practitioners. And I, I, I highlighted this word, shoulders, uh, because it comes into play in this next quote. Because then, as opposed to the way the Pharisees approached the covenant, living Torah, which when you see the word righteousness, by the way, when you see the word righteousness in Matthew, we think of righteousness as like being morally upstanding, you know, paying your taxes, you know, not going through red lights, 
not engaging in other kind of semi-illicit activity, being a good moral person? No. It's about the covenant. Righteousness comes from the Greek dikaiosine, uh, which means covenant faithfulness. Again, that's the, that's the central marker of the Jewish people, is the covenant. That's what defines them. The law is in service of helping them live their covenant fidelity and identity. So let's not get confused with righteousness. Yes, you can be a goody two-shoes, but if you're not actually living the covenant call, then who cares how you act morally? It's irrelevant. Um, so, you know, uh, Jesus gives this, he's, he presents, is presented as the true son of the gracious God, not the judgmental, hard, hard legalistic God of the Pharisees of their day, right? Not Jesus' day, but their day. Um, so this, you know, this kind of lovely thing and then the father and, um, is so important and the father, everybody knows who the father is through the son. And, but the key line here is the yoke. So again, the yoke goes on your shoulders. So the burden and his yoke, Jesus' yoke is light as opposed to the heavy burdens. And the yoke typically, I don't, I don't know, you know, oxen usually come in pairs. So you you're, have the yoke on one. Who's the other ox? Jesus. He's there with you. See, he's the other ox. Even though the ox is what Luke, is what the symbol is used in Luke, it really applies here to Matthew. Uh, so, uh, and then the, the, the key text here is... Um, the Great Commission, which is the, 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 the culminating lines of the gospel in which it's about discipleship. It's also kind of embodies this Isaiah universalism that Israel is to be the light to the nations, the salt of the earth, to be the one in which, uh, the, the way in which God brings all the nations into community, into, you know, into unity with. Um, but well, look at this. So in the text, it typically says, when you read the text, at the very end, it says, um, it typically says, I am with you, right? But actually the Greek is ego, meth, hymon, am I, in which it says, um, I with you am. Now that doesn't make any sense in English. But if Jesus is Emmanuel, and Emmanuel is the living presence, abiding presence of God in the world, then you see how I am brackets with you. Now that's a pretty profound statement. Um, the idea that the I am is, is encompassing you, or us, right? So that's the idea that the abiding presence, just like when, 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 the, when it says, and the rabbis say, and the rabbinic sayings that when two or more are reading Torah, God is present. Jesus says something along the same lines, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there, there. So this idea of presence is so critical in how uh, Matthew is going to understand Jesus. Jesus is the presence of God in the world. God dwells in him the way God dwells in the temple, but actually it's more like the Torah, uh, the presence of God in the Torah. So presenting Jesus as the most Jews, Jewish of Jews, uh, Jesus' genealogy, Jesus' Jewish genealogy, as opposed to Luke, comes at the very beginning. And of course, Matthew is presented as the first gospel in the four chain. Why? Because it starts, it's a bridge. It's a bridge between the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. You wouldn't put Mark there because people want to know, well, what's the connection? So for Christians, they get this, I mean, obviously if Jews would read Mark, they would get it because it opens with an exodus passing of the Red Sea uh, with Jesus' baptism and the Son of God language and all that. But so Luke puts it in chapter 3, the genealogy, after he does all this birth stuff, which he thinks is more important. And then also the genealogy traces back in Matthew to Abraham, who's the father of the nation of Israel, right? And opposed to Luke, as we're going to see, who traces it back to Adam, the first human being. So Luke has got, you know, they're both doing, they're both doing um, infancy narratives, um, but um, they're very different. And then the, the, the infancy narrative, of course, is radically different from Luke. 
And all these key features are very Jewish. Uh, dreams, the use of dreams, which is a very way God communicates to people, and use of angels as messengers, and um, the virgin birth is, in some sense, again, this is the, this theme of fulfillment, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. See, if Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, then why do the synagogue across the street have any objections? We just showed it to you. It's very apologetic in terms of that. Uh, we could talk a little bit more about the fact that the, 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 the version of Isaiah here is from the Septuagint, not from the Hebrew, uh, which makes a difference in how you translate that first word. Um, you know, Jesus has given a name that he's no, is not in any of the other Gospels, which is Emmanuel, which, of course, is our favorite Christmas carol. Um, but the question is, is God with us? And the question for the Jews is not, does God exist? Or what is the nature of God? Or uh, who's, it's, no, where is God? Where? Location, 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 right? What real estate does God occupy? And for, the, for Matthew, it's Jesus. Jesus is the zip code. You want to find God? Go to the Jesus zip code. And Jesus, unlike the temple and the priest, is available 24-7. The access, there's no access problems. You don't need a password. You don't need to pay a membership. You just instant access. Um, so, and then, you know, David, Bethlehem, that's the place of the Messiah. And even, even, the, even the pagans worship and recognize Jesus for who he is. Um, the star, you know, the, the, get the cosmic dimensions of Jesus' uh, messianic hood. Uh, you know, the Holy Family and Jesus is the story of Moses all over again. And then they put him in Nazareth, which is probably historically accurate, but again, Matthew loves it. It fulfills a prophecy, so it all works for him. And then the idea that Jesus gives the, 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 five, the, new, the new Torah and that he himself is not just a lawgiver, but he is the law. He embodies the law. So that's a very different thing, as we're going to see from the rest. Um, so Jesus is, you know, you would, if you read some parts of Christianity, they would think that Judaism is abrogated, superseded by Christianity, but in Matthew's, that's not the case. It's not the abolishment or the supersession of the law, the Jewish way of life, but it's the fulfillment. It is, and then, uh, you know, Jesus uh, speaks with the authority when he says, Amen. Like, he starts with amen. He doesn't end with amen, right? In our prayers, we end with amen. Jesus starts with amen like, this is the way it is, folks. <laughs> okay? Um, so, there's multi so there's tons of text in which the notion of fulfillment. So every miracle. See, for Mark, the miracles are about the restoration the vindication, the inclusion, the rehabilitation of people back into, the, into God's, you know, grace and world. Um, whereas for, for Matthew, it's all about, well, this is, gee, this is Jesus fulfilling a prophecy. And the parables, you think, well, what does the parables have to do with Judaism? But no, 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 it's there. It's all there. It's Isaiah, Psalms, okay? Jesus is simply echoing and being the fulfillment of all Jewish tradition in life. There's this beautiful image that I think uh, that, see, Jesus comes and says in Matthew, I come only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, of course, that tells you two things. One is that um, it's Israel, but the lost sheep of Israel means not the Pharisees. It means the people who have been denigrated and ostracized and expelled from the synagogue because of their lack of, of, of you know, living according to the, legal, to the ritual standards of the law, which the Pharisees, as you saw in that quote, are pretty merciless in applying. Um, so Matthew has this idea that Jesus is not for Jews alone, or even certain kinds of Jews, but that God dwells in Jesus, right? See the circles? It's kind of like a ripple effect. God dwells in Jesus, Jesus dwells in the church, which is this mediating reality between Jesus and the world, which Mark doesn't have. Luke is going to care a lot about it, and John, not so much, but the ecclesiology of, of the Jewish ecclesiology of, uh, of Matthew comes to play, whereas Luke's going to have more Gentile ecclesiology. And then the church is in the world. So you can see the kind of spreading effect. 
And the Great Commission has this idea is go out. So, you know, I'm, you know, go out, disciples, the world. So it's this ever-expanding effect. So here's some texts that support that reading. Um, no doubt about the first. The second is a little bit more trickier. Uh, but, but Jesus is present there. So again, the idea of presence is, 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 is the Christological key for understanding uh, Matthew's Jesus. The presence of God. That's a very Jewish way of understanding God. Right? God is here, but God is not here. God is imminent, but God is transcendent. That's the Jewish respect. And so Jesus, in some sense, is the, you know, the human dwelling place, the, the vessel of the divine, the tent of the divine. Um, and then the church, and then the church, so Jesus' presence then becomes, the church becomes the presence of Jesus in the world, and then the church is, you know, has this effect on, um, on the world, the salt of the earth and the light of the world, which, again, that all echoes back to Jewish understandings of Israel. What's her job? That's her job. That's her vocation, especially in the Isaiah text, Deuteroisaiah. That's pal. Okay, so this is kind of fun. Let's play, let's play compare and contrast. Let's play contrast game. Um, Whoops. All right, so what are, the, what, are the, what are the Matthean community members tempted to do? What is their temptation, which is to live according to the kind of Pharisaic uh, mores or habits or sensibilities or ways of approaching the covenant? And um, excuse me one second. I've got to get these other notes out because I was told that I needed to put less text on the, on the slides because it was so tiny. And people couldn't read it. And I was like, well, I can read it. But I'm standing right here. Not fair. Um, okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So the gospel condemns all forms of legalism, which in some sense are external obedience to the law, our external ways of, of, of the Torah. So all the 666 rules and regulations, that's what makes a difference. Or, more importantly, um, yeah, so if you sort of follow the, the, you know, the rules, so to speak, then that's, that's what the Pharisees are promoting, which Jesus is saying, no, you have to interiorize the law. So even in Judaism, the idea is, you know, do not circumcise your flesh, but circumcise your heart, right? So even even so, it's not that the Jews in the Old Testament are bad, and the, and the, you know Jesus is good. That's a very poor understanding. Jesus is simply calling the people to a more you know authentic form of living the covenant. That's all he's doing. He's not actually trying to create a new religion. He's trying to reform it here in Matthew. It's a restoration movement, not a supersessionist abnegation of Judaism movement. That's the point. So uh, authentic worship, so there's the discussion of the Father, um, the Magi worship, the baby Jesus, and um, the idea, you know, actually remember the, in, the, in the Lenten, and excuse me, Ash Wednesday, the text we read every Ash Wednesday, they come from Matthew about fasting, alms, and praying. They're all about the interiorization of those practices, not their exterior manifestation. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Father who's in heaven, you have, you have to choose between God and mammon, um, the women at the tomb, the Beatitudes, um, the clean heart. Um, so there's this idea of of you have to interiorize both your worship and practice <clears throat> of the covenant. It's not enough just to, you know, follow, you know, go the speed limit, which I don't do anyway. So um, if anybody's ever ridden a car with me, it's pretty scary. Uh, uh, so the other idea here is that in the, in, what's being presented here is this notion of self-reliance, that Pharisees are sort of, because they have it, right? I mean, they've got it. They know what to do. They know how to do it. They know when to do it. And they know why. 
And so this kind of incredible sense of self-reliance and Jesus presents this sort of trust in the Father that you have to be, you have to trust and not be in control. So the issues of control, I don't know if people who are really uh, rule-following people tend to be very hyper-controlled, right? They want control. They want the rules so they know what to do. So, but this, Jesus is, not, Jesus is not throwing out the rules. He's just saying, look, you've got to have a different orientation to him. You need to trust in the Father, not yourself. Uh, this is the huge one. And I think this is what condemns most Christians, um, besides the first two, <laughs> which is intense judgmentalism. Um, you know, you did wrong, you're out of bounds, you're a sinner, you know, you're excommunicated. Um, all of that kind of language comes into play. Um, and uh, Jesus is, you know, Jesus is like about forgiveness and mercy. So, you know, Peter says, hey... Um, how many times uh, must we forgive? Seven times? I mean, that's the prescription, right? The prescri- which is a lot. Like, how many of you can forgive seven times? I mean, that's just hard. I mean, I no way. You, you once, right? Like, once, what's the saying? Uh, you fool me once, shame on me. You fool me, no, you fool, shame on you, you fool me. You know, okay, so you, you tre- <laughs> right? You, you, you trespass against me once, shame on you. You trespass against me twice, shame on me. Well, okay, so seven times. So Peter's like saying, you know, hey, seven, that's plenty, right? And Jesus says, no, it's seven times seven, which, of course, if you ask my eight-year-old, who's very good at his multiplication, tell it's 49. And I said, what about the 50th time, Gabriel? He's like, mm, you're out of bounds. <laughs> so really, it's, but it's seven times 70 is infinite, right? It's a, hyper, it's a hyperbole, it's hyperbole, which is a very Jewish, near, Middle Eastern, Near Eastern way of speaking. Jesus speaks an incredible hyperbole here in Matthew. So, you know, if, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it. No, no, stop. Don't do it. <laughs> right? Okay, don't cut off the part of you. No, don't do that. It's all hyperbolic. Don't take it literally. So uh, Jesus is very much into that. Um, this is a huge problem for uh, leaders uh, in, the, in, the, in the different congregations and communities in Christianity, which is uh, clericalism in which, you know, uh, the leader, the cleric, the ordained minister, the person in charge says, do it because I say so, right? So it's this kind of idea, this superiority, this because by virtue of their office, they have the right to sort of, um, you know, dictate rules and commands to you. Uh, that's, not, that's not what Matthew's about. Um, and he's about this kind of egalitarianism because he says, you know, what you bind, what, and he says, what you, plural, bind is bound on, you know, is bound. Not one particular individual. Right? There's no rabbi who's kind of sitting in judgment. Um, the possession of these abilities to forgive and not forgive. Oh, back to the forgiveness thing, right? So there's a whole protocol on how do you, there's a whole, like, practice of forgiveness, which none of us use, right? So someone offends you, you go to them, you talk to them in private. If you don't get no recourse, then you go to, you know, you bring another person in or a couple of people to mediate that conversation. And then if that doesn't work, you bring them in front of the whole church. And if that doesn't work, you throw them out. Now, typically, we move from the fence to throwing them out. That's not due process. So Matthew has his whole due process about how to do church. And it's amazing why Christians haven't read it. Um, exclusion. Um, so, you know, again, um, the, the, the Pharisees think that they're the chosen people, they're in good stead with God because of their ethnic origin. So by virtue of being a Jew, you're in. And if you're not Jewish, you're out. So you can be, you can be a God-fearer, but you can't convert. Right? You can't become a member of the tribe of Israel. You can be a, a God-fearer, but you can't actually be a part of it. Where Jesus... In Matthew, it's, it's highly inclusive. So the Magi, right, these pagans, these people from different lands, they get it. They know who he is. Um, there's the idea of the, the commissioning to all the nations. There is um, um, the multiplication of the loaves. The second multiplication is to the Gentiles. So it's Jew and Gentile. There's two multiplications. One is to the Jews, one is to the Gentiles, which actually emulates Mark. But, you know, for Matthew, it's got a different stake at it. Um, the parable of the laborers, actually, you remember the people who come, that was in the week before, right? They come at the last day 
the last hour, the 11th hour. Who are those people? They're the Gentiles. That's nothing to do with the fair wage, but it's about the inclusion in the kingdom. And so the Gentiles are late to the show. They're in. And the people who are griping and moaning? The Pharisees. Well, hey, we were here first. You know, we've been here longer. Um, and the sheep and goat, they, actually, if you look at the parable of the judgment scene of the sheep and the goats, the people, the, the people who are either sheeps or goats, are they Christians or not? Are they Jews or not? There's no indication. It's all about how they treated the other. It's irrelevant of their religious orientation or organizational membership. It doesn't matter. So this idea that being a part of the kingdom is this inclusive call. Um, the miracles of healing, you do still have the centurion and the leper. They're all about you know, re-including people who have been excluded by either some kind of, you know, they're not Jews or they're not Jewish enough. So, boy, it's hard. So um, the other thing is, um, is to portray them negatively. I didn't get to finish the slide. <laughs> but basically the idea here is just that um, the Romans get a pass in Matthew. You know, Pilate has this dream. His wife has a dream, and she comes and tells him, you know, to have nothing to do with this man. And Pilate's like, okay. And he washes his hands, literally washes his hands of Jesus' blood, which in some ways is, double, is a double entendre, as we're going to see, because the blood of Jesus is salvific, because it represents the blood of the atonement, uh, ritual, the Yom Kippur, in which blood is then sprinkled. You know, because you think about, so we think about Passover and Rosh Hashanah, and of course everybody loves Hanukkah, which we they don't care about so much. But you know, Yom Kippur and Passover. Yom Kippur is when every year when the Jews celebrate the God forgiving them their sins and bringing them back into reconciliation. At one mint, atonement is at one mint. And so the blood of the, of, the, of, the, of the animal is sprinkled on the people and the altar, which represents God, and it's a cleansing agent. And, the, you know, it's so, and then the blood on the doorpost. And so blood is a, is a sign of life. And so when Pilate washes his hands of Jesus' blood, it means he has no place in the kingdom. No place. And he's also explicated, uh, yeah, um, well, let off the hook. Um, for the death of Jesus. And so all of it lies on the religious leaders. And there's this famous saying, which has become the phrase that Christians have used to persecute Jews throughout the centuries as Christ killers, is this one. But it's totally ironic. The blood of Jesus is salvific for Matthew. When Jesus talks about the Last Supper, this is my blood of the new how can that be bad? So the idea is, is that what Matthew's saying is that they're unknowingly, ironically calling for, you know, the life force of Jesus to be upon them. <laughs> they don't know it. So again, the use of irony in these texts is often lost on, on most Christians, and tragically, in this case. Um, so the disciples then, you also rebuilt the disciples as well as making the Pharisees look negative. Um, and so um, we have to rush through this because... I don't have time, but we're almost done. Um, then we come back and have questions. Um, discipleship is a key idea in, um, in Matthew, not so much in, in, in Mark. Uh, Mark, they're just trying to get back on their feet. Whereas in Matthew, they're trying to move forward. Um, so um, there's all these different phrases and sayings. I mean, like, so... Um, the faithful women, so at the end of Mark, right, the women, are, the, the, the guy in the tomb tells the women to go do something, and they come out and they don't do it. They're afraid. They're just as unfaithful as the rest of the disciples were. Here, they do it. They, they do, you know, so they get it. Um, the idea, remember, of the little faith is really a, it's, an, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compliment. It might be a left-handed compliment, but it's still a compliment. Um, so there's all these texts that support the idea that they do have some, they have a modicum of faith, which is better than having no faith. And they just need to, they just need to continue to get rid of their tendency to uh, ape and imitate uh, the people who have been telling them they're not sufficiently Jewish. 
Um, they still they worship, but they doubt. So it's not a complete 100% positive picture. Um, by the way, so in Luke, right, uh, the, the 12, the 11 becomes the 12. Who's the 12th person in, in, in the Great Commission? Jesus. I'm with you. He's the 12th. So Judas steps off, Jesus fills in. Whereas in, I think, in, in Luke, um, in Acts, then somebody else comes in to play the part. Well, that's next week. So I'll, I'll study Luke next week. Um, so again, they, they increase their understanding. They get it, which is the complete antithesis of the way they're portrayed in Mark. So again, the idea is, is that um, the, you know, they're sort of on the same page. Now, this is one of the most interesting things about uh, Matthew is that Peter is featured prominently in Matthew. He's missing. I mean, he, he's, he's there in Mark, but there's his, his part is expanded. And people say, well, why? And the, the answer is, is that uh, because Peter is more Jewish than Paul. Because in the argument, the argument, and we're going to see in Acts at the Council of Jerusalem is, what is the status of the Gentiles? And you have James on the hard right, who's the brother of Jesus. You have Paul, who's on the left, who's arguing for total Gentile inclusion without any, without any restrictions or barriers to entry. And then you have Peter, right in the middle. And of course, what does he do? He waffles. So he's first in the Jamesian camp or some kind of modified Jamesian camp, and then Paul confronts him. So, but the idea is that Petrine Christianity for Matthew is the norm. That's the preferred form of Christianity, which has gone extinct. It doesn't exist in any form or fashion. In the, in, you know, after, I don't know, 130, 20, 120, 130, it's all gone. Gone, 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 gone. So uh, Peter is the rock, which of course is a pun because Peter is really silly putty. He's a bad... Yeah. Now, Jesus has a sense of irony, right? So he calls him, you know, um, Simon Peter, um, in which he's going to build his ecclesia, his synagogue, his, 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 the instrument in which God is going to redeem Israel. Basically, he's going to be the, he's going to, you know, be the Israel. So it's really not about Peter, per se. It's the form of Christianity the form of uh, Jewish Christianity it presents. And there's this you know, phrase about building your house on rock, not sand. And so this, this play on the rock. And then Jesus gives him the keys to the kingdom, which is, which is rabbinic. So it's a rabbinic idea that the, the keys are given to the head rabbi to the synagogue. Got it? It's not about some other Petrine office. So um, the idea here is, is that if you see the quote, that um, the idea is, is that, that again, that, and I can't, I can't substantiate this further than I have t- tonight or right now, but that um, that's what's being proffered, and that's why Peter plays such a prominent role, and he walks on the water. In the Markin episode, he ain't there. I mean, he's in the boat, but he doesn't come out, and he, he, he does pretty good. I mean, he gets like halfway and then he blows it. But see, that's, that's Matthew's depiction of the disciples, is that they're kind of, they're almost there, but they're kind of not quite there, and they will get there. 